You are watching Christ's Commission Fellowship. Changing lives for eternity. So awesome to be here. Um, Beth and I are currently on a three-month, five-country tour. We get to travel all over the world presenting this, and uh, very, very quickly, the Philippines have raced to the top of our favorite places to be, and we hope you'll have us back. We love you. <laughs> well, let's jump in and explain a little bit about the journey that we're going to go on this afternoon. I've authored, as was mentioned, two books, and the one I'm going to talk to you out of today is the newest one called Digital Cocaine. Uh, in my education background, I'm not a neuroscientist yet. I would like to be one someday, but I have progressed far enough along that the University of South Africa has asked me to join in collaboration with their Bureau of Market Research and its Neuroscience Division. So I stop in and out of Africa quite often and participate in projects, research projects, and I set some up, and we study uh, the digital effect on the brain, and I specialize in digital addiction at this point. So that's the journey I want to take you on. The cover of the book actually comes from neuroscience. When you look at brain scans, and I'll show you the technologies today that are used to measure activity or the lack thereof in the brain. When you look at brain scans of people who have crossed over into digital addiction, and you look at the brain scans of people who are addicted to cocaine and sometimes heroin, those brain scans are identical, nearly identical. That means you can be addicted to anything, and it takes place in the same area of the brain, so that's where this comes from, and we'll dive into that in just a few minutes. But before we get started, I have a little bit of nerd humor for you. Um, let me know if any of you, especially if you're just a little bit older, can relate to this. Now, in my world, you're going to hear me refer <laughs> to a lot of research that we do with millennials, which are those born from uh, 1982 onward. They're also referred to as Gen Y, and their children are known as Generation Z or Z. Uh, so this is Jesus sitting on a park bench with a millennial, and he says, no, I'm not talking about Twitter. I literally want you to follow me. Privileged to speak in Catholic schools, and this is a nod to our Catholic friends. Father, I have sinned. That's Facebook. And he says, I already know. And this is called cell phone tan. Just to introduce Beth and me just a little bit more, where is Beth? Honey, would you wave? Stand up and wave at everyone, please. This is Beth. She's gorgeous. This is the university where I'm privileged to do some research, but we are based, obviously we're Americans. This is the state of Virginia. Anybody ever hear a song called Country Roads, Take Me Home? Well, that was written in West Virginia, which is the state uh, across from us, but we share the same mountain range where John Denver sang about that in the same river, the Shenandoah River, and that's what it looks like where we live. So that's not far from my house. We do a lot of hiking and the little town we come from, you've probably never heard of it. It's called Stewart's Draft, Virginia, and there's about 9,000 people there. So we don't have traffic. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we'll think of you when we go home, okay, and pray for you. Yes, we will, because we love you now. We're family. <laughs> uh, again, we're going to talk out of this book, but that's the first one that I wrote. It'll be available first quarter, approximately first quarter of next year. I've, it's, it's nine years old. I've been talking about this for quite a while. But we've taken out a publication temporarily to revise it because some of the technology terms uh, have changed. But we'll, we'll deal with this, and this book is here uh, today. Just want to let you know that when uh, I wrote that book, Dark Side of Technology, I quickly uh, got the reputation, obtained the reputation that I'm the guy who hates technology. And so churches didn't want me to come in because at that time they had just begun to integrate cameras and projection and all this technology that we have now using social media as a promotional platform. And uh, the editor of my book picked up on this uh, right away and said, you should probably tell people what your qualifications are so that they don't think you hate technology. So I need to tell you that uh, I have a computer science degree. So it's not like I don't know what this is or that I hate it. And I did not renounce uh, my computer science degree when I took up neuroscience. And it was also suggested that I show you my desk at home where I work. So there's my desk. So if you want to have a look at that. So no, I, I do not hate technology at all. Uh, however, that desk nearly killed me uh, for a number of reasons. When I say killed me, not physically, but emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. And I want to talk to you about what we've learned about digital addiction. 
But more than science, of all the science that I'm privileged to do, the best advice that I could ever give you is to not put your faith and trust in science. Science is helpful. But if I were you, I would put my faith and my trust, first of all, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, secondly, I would put my faith and my trust in the inerrant, infallible, God-breathed Word known as the Bible, which is the final authority for all faith and conduct. And if you believe that, would you please say amen? amen? Everything is permissible for me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing to a very carnal and worldly church at the city of Corinth. And he's saying, look, they were arguing over legalism and things of the law. And he said, look, everything is permissible for me because we live under grace now, but not everything is beneficial. And then he goes on to draw a line in the sand. And he says, this is the line you don't cross. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by it. I won't become a slave to it. I won't be addicted to it. So in the context of today's message, which is technology, I'm using a tablet, a very nice one, and I have a very nice phone. It's permissible, but not everything about these is beneficial. In fact, it can be quite destructive. And the thing that I don't want to do is bring legalism into this. And I love this verse of Scripture from Ecclesiastes, whoever fears God will avoid the extremes. On the one extreme, I don't want to come in here and say, look, all technology is bad, and so at the end of the service, we're going to have a big barrel at the end and go to the back, and we're all going to burn our phones. We're not going to do that because they have the potential to be used for good. But on the other hand, I can't say, you know what? The grace of God covers everything, so give all of these gadgets, give the internet to your child, let them go into their bedroom, shut the door, and Jesus will sort it out because the grace of God covers everything. That's the other extreme, and we want to avoid those extremes. The last thing I want to say to you that will come up again and again, though, but the last thing scripturally for the moment is this verse of Scripture. As we delve particularly into the neuroscience, I'm going to reveal to you what the symptoms of digital addiction are, and many of you are going to look at this and you're going to panic and you're going to think to yourself, you just described my child. I hear it all the time, and I will, but you need to know something. I didn't come here to scare you with this science. I didn't come here to beat you up with these truths that you're going to see. You see, the reality is God is on a digital rescue mission, and all the things that we cover here today are reversible. That's the good news, and the brain scans show it. And so what I want you to do is have an open heart and an open mind because I think God wants you to have that. And understand there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The reality is this is our world. This is what we see everywhere. This is ubiquitous. There's nowhere that we travel that we don't see this. We don't even see it anymore. I'm drawing your attention to it because when you get this way, when you are with people, but you are not with people, something has hijacked the reward circuit of your brain. Now, everyone loves their child or their children, and they want the best for them. Many people have bought into the line that if we don't give technology to our children at the youngest age possible and teach them how to use it and to multitask, our children will not be successful because the world and its jobs have gone completely digital. But I want to show you something, something that is very, very deceptive. While this looks like this child is focused and engaged, very quickly that turns from engagement to mesmerization chemically. And it is not a, a miracle, nor is it an accident that a child can take mom or dad's phone or granddad's cell phone and without any instruction, intuitively know how to use it. These devices are designed that way to be very simple, such that the fastest growing demographic, I believe, of digital addiction is our grandparents. We're losing grandma to Candy Crush and Pinterest now. And many of you are laughing because you understand exactly what I'm talking about. A couple of kids came to me not long ago, and they said, Granddad took us fishing. And I went, that's great. And they said, well, it was great. But the problem is we did all the fishing and granddad sat in a chair and played on Facebook the whole day. And I hear that more and more. Technologies that are used to measure activity in the brain would be EEG. This is actually a measurement of brain waves in the form of the activity. 
And then there's the MRI. Many of you have probably been in an MRI, magnetic resonating imaging, to do a deep body scan to find something on a very small level going on in your body or the attempt to find it. And with a helmet that you can put on that sort of has these sensors in that helmet, you can put people in there, and that becomes a functional MRI, fMRI, which you can measure the brain. For example, they put people in there, and they've had them look at pornography. And on a real-time screen, you can watch the brain's response to pornography in real time. You can have them Google. You can have them do a number of things. And then there is a technology called SPECT, S-P-E-C-T, which is an acronym that simply stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. All that means is it's another, a different way, but a very effective way to measure activity in the brain. And these images come from the Dr. Daniel Amen Clinics from across America. This is a baseline of a healthy brain. It's nice and smooth, lots of activity. Now I want to show you uh, the brain scan of someone who smokes marijuana. So when in my country, uh, around election time, you'll see these guys, these libertarians going on uh, television smoking marijuana, saying it's good for you, doesn't harm me, I dare to differ. Because I don't live in the land of theory. I live in the land of x-rays. <laughs> sort of like a, someone who has a broken femur. Let's just say you put an x-ray and it's broken in three places, and the person goes, no, nah, man, that, that, that's not my leg. Then you can simply say, well, why don't you have a run and see how that works out for you. Same with the brain now. We know that explains the slowness of speech, slowness of the thought process. These are brain images of direct brain injuries. They happen to be of NFL football players, and even though they're wearing helmets, that does not prevent the brain from slapping on the inside of the skull, giving them a series of concussions, and the brain deteriorates into a condition called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Maybe some of you saw the movie called Concussion, where Will Smith played the part of a Nigerian forensic pathologist by the name of Dr. Bennett Amalu. And this is when they uh, first discovered this sort of damage. This is a cocaine brain and how it deteriorates, and this is what someone who gets addicted to screen technology, their brain would look like. I want to show you this. The normal brain on the left with lots of activity. The heroin brain, look how, look how much uh, activity has left the brain when they inject that drug through the vein. It gets into the brain and that opiate effect occurs. But look at the worst one of all outside of a direct brain injury. By far, the worst one of all is the porn brain. And that drug was delivered through the eyes. No bloodstream needed to metabolize that drug or to carry it directly to the brain. That went in through the eyes, connected directly in the back of the head called the occipital lobe, and the effect was instant, and the drug emanated most likely from a phone. And it changed the brain chemically. A few minutes ago, I showed you the cartoons for a reason. I wanted you to understand, first of all, I wanted you to laugh and relax a little bit. You probably had to fight maybe a little bit of traffic on Sunday, not much, hopefully. But you had to get dressed, you had to get the kids ready, and all of that that happens, and we appreciate that. And you probably came in and needed to settle down a little bit. So I used laughter, which the Bible says is like a medicine to help you. But when you get too much medicine, the brain reacts much like this. So I want to show you how this process works. I designed some brain animations based on the work of Dr. Archibald Hart. He's a scientist and a clinical psychologist, and he's written a book. It's an old book now. I'm not even sure it's in print. But this is when I first discovered the first neuroscience that started to explain the behaviors of digital addiction. And it's called Thrilled to Death, subtitled, How the Endless Pursuit of Pleasure is Leaving Us Numb. So let me give you some symptoms of addiction, and then I will show you what addiction looks like in the animations that I've, I've designed. When it comes to addiction, addiction takes place essentially in the same area of the brain. So let me go ahead and show you that area of the brain where addiction occurs. It's not on the surface, it's in the nucleus, and that area is called the nucleus accumbens. It's just the pleasure center, the pleasure center of the brain. The reason we get addicted is because we enjoy things too much. Nothing wrong with enjoying some things, certainly not sinful things, but when we enjoy too much, the brain reacts. So someone who smokes cigarettes, for example, they would ingest the smoke into their lungs, the tar and the nicotine and the other chemicals that have been added 
to the tobacco to make it more habit, even more habit-forming, will get into the bloodstream through the lungs, transported to the brain. The brain then responds in two different areas, and the brain generates a neurotransmitter called dopamine, and it's the dopamine that has that effect of calming when you smoke cigarettes and helps to relieve the stress. It's enjoyable. That's why people do it. But their symptoms as they get addicted would be coughing, and ultimately they might have lung issues such as emphysema. Someone who drinks alcohol, they would deliver the drug through the mouth, it would go into the stomach, metabolize through the liver, it would make its way to the brain, and that stimulant would cause two parts of the brain to generate dopamine, and the dopamine is very pleasurable, and dopamine is what they're actually feeling, that's what's making them feel high or drunk. And when you get too much, the brain starts to build up resistance to the drug, making you do more of the drug over time. With digital addiction, the drug is delivered through the eyes, sometimes through the ears if the video or the imaging has audio with it, and the brain gets stimulated, and that's the area of the brain that responds just like any other stimulant. Now, the symptoms. As the resistance builds up in the body, in other words, as the addiction grows to digital addiction, even though it's in the same area of the brain, the delivery mechanism is through the eyes, and the top three symptoms are this. Number one, anger. You know what it's like to use this as a babysitter. It works, cheap, it's amazing, almost angelic. You hand it to the child, the child calms, and it's almost as if angels are going, ah! you love it. Problem is, when it comes time to take it away, the meltdowns. They're getting very, very bad these days. As the technology increases in intensity, as it accelerates in stimulation, the meltdowns are getting worse. So the symptoms, number one, anger. Number two, there are two symptoms that go hand in hand, anxiety and depression. And third is emotional numbness. That's the condition known as anhedonia, but emotional numbness. So let's have a look at this. When I use the cartoons to stimulate you, I cause the release of dopamine in your brain and my brain, and I used your eyes, and I knew that I had caused this effect because I heard many of you laughing. Nothing wrong with that until you get too much. When the brain gets too much dopamine from overstimulation from drugs and eating and chocolate and digital drugs, the brain starts to build up resistance. It's sort of like the alcoholic who didn't start off being an alcoholic. They started off just drinking a couple of beers after work to decompress. That dopamine was making them feel good after a stressful day. But over time, the body got used to just two beers. And if they wanted to continue to feel the same level of high, they would then gradually have to consume more of the alcohol. Am I making sense to you? And that's because this wall forms in the brain trying to push out all of the extra dopamine. And so it forces us to do more and more of the activity to generate larger and larger quantities of dopamine to saturate the ever-growing barrier so that it spills over and gives us our fix. Now, if there are any doctors here or neuroscientists, you, you may be cringing that I made it with a wall there because um, it's actually a very complex chemical reaction around the nucleus accumbens. But the problem is I speak to children <laughs> And to talk like that in front of them would be a disaster. So I created the animation this way, ran this past some doctors, got the thumbs up, and so I speak about it simply. Is that okay with you? But it's a wall nonetheless. It's a barrier, and that's the resistance that builds up in the brain. That's what addiction is. The constant, repetitive, got to do it longer, harder, and more intensely to overcome the ever-growing wall. Here's where symptom number three comes in, emotional numbness, anhedonia. It's when you don't deal with the addiction and you just keep pushing it harder and harder and eventually that dopaminergic wall just gets so strong and so big that it cuts off all of the dopamine and that is very unnatural to the brain because we need small amount of dopamine. You need it to learn cognitively. You need it to enjoy relationship with people. You need it to, to study the Bible. You need it to feel God's presence because it's about feeling pleasure and joy, and now you've cut it all off. 
In practical ways to understand this, if you are an entrepreneur or a business person and you have worked long hours, burned the candle at both ends, including the middle, to keep the business afloat, or you've been driven because things are actually successful and you just keep expanding and expanding, and in one day you just collapsed emotionally, it's called burnout. That's what it looks like. Same thing. You've overtaxed the pleasure center. What you've actually done is, is caused the adrenal system to get an overload, but you emotionally withdraw. The video gamers will withdraw. Video gamers don't want to interact with people. They only want to play the game. Very uh, s socially, they're not interested in face-to-face -face conversations because they, if they're not constantly being stimulated, they have anxiety. And they can, often very intelligent people, and they can justify their behavior and tell you why it's not affecting them and convince their parents and, and on and on this goes, but the parents deep inside know something is very off about this behavior because the child used to not be this way. This is how it manifests in the digital domain. With social media, something that could be a great help and asset with me traveling the world, checking on my, my mom at home and staying in touch with people in a very practical way, it turns into from, from something very practical to where the head just stays down all the time. And you try to have a conversation with someone, but they won't engage with you because they're constantly scrolling, going, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. But you know intuitively they're not listening to you. Worst of all, we withdraw from God because God and His activities, do you remember the word analog? Analog means non-digital. Non-digital activities such as face-to-face -face conversation and prayer and scripture reading and just having a, a coffee with someone generates the proper amount of dopamine, but if you come to God or you come to another human being with that wall, you're going to quickly get bored with that activity because that activity is only going to generate the proper amount of dopamine, but in order for you to not have anxiety, you have to have a lot of dopamine, so you're going to want to grab your phone. I'm guessing, based on photographs that my wife has taken in auditoriums all over the world, many of you have been constantly checking the whole time I've been speaking. And it's because I'm boring to you. I'm not offended at all. I just know what's happening in your brain. I'm only able to generate the proper amount of dopamine for learning. But the problem is you've come to church with a wall. And as the dopamine levels decreased, you've had anxiety. And in order to get your fix, you're going to have to check something and then once you get the dopamine levels up, you'll put it down and resume watching me. Am I making sense to you? And when you approach God that way, you're missing out on what He has to say. Let me, let me show you how we miss out, just, just on a practical thing that neuroscience has taught us conclusively. Now, ladies, can you multitask better than the men? Of course you can. You know how this works. Um, mom and dad have, let's say, three little kids. And these three little kids are going throughout the house, rummaging, pillaging, trying to burn the house down, all that sort of stuff. And, and mom can manage all of this chaos, right? Mom can do that, and she can manage the laundry and the phone calls. And where's dad throughout this whole chaotic process? He's on the couch. Because if dad had to manage all of that, the children would, would die, right? So that... But, but, but this is not the kind of multitasking that I'm talking about. Truly, in that analog context, it seems like women can juggle more things. But this is digital multitasking where a child sits down to do their homework with a tablet, but there's multiple tabs open. There's a phone there. There's earphones on. Does this sound familiar? The TV's going in the living room. And the truth of the matter is, there's even schools, one-to-one -one laptop and tablet programs that will say in order for our learners to be successful later, we've got to get technology in their hands at the youngest age possible and teach them how to do that proficiently, otherwise they won't be able to get jobs. And the problem is there's not a human being on planet Earth that can multitask, not one. And when you try to do it, your brain gets on overload with dopamine and it makes cognitive abilities deteriorate. Let me explain. Some of you are looking at me shaking your head, the older ones, but some of the younger ones are looking at me as if to say, I am the exception. I can do that. Well, here's the truth. I'll put you to the test in just a moment. The truth is we can only pay attention to one thing at a time. For those IT people here, computer people here, 
It's sort of like um, if you have a multi-core processor and your software is threaded properly, you can take one task, divide it up amongst the cores, and truly can take one task and do them at the same time, thus rendering your project much faster. But the problem is the human brain is a sequential processor. One core, one chip, and it can only do one thing at a time. The illusion is we can switch between things so rapidly we think we're multitasking and our productivity is up, but when you measure it, no one is productive. In fact, it decreases dramatically. So I'm going to give you the same test that was given to us at the University of Queensland. I was taking a professional development course, and the subject matter was bringing neuroscience into the classroom, making all of this very practical. So here's the test. Very simple. I'm going to put a written poem on the screen, and at the same time, I'm going to play a second and different poem, and I simply want you to pay attention to both, and at the end of it, I'll give you a comprehension test to see how well you multitask. <laughs> okay, everybody ready? It's, it's interesting. I still see this reaction of the older people are like, nah. but the young one's like, I'm going to get him. <clears throat> I'm like, what is that? But whatever. Do it if that helps, okay? <laughs> All right, you ready? Here we go. My bones worn out. My body failed me when I harbored my sins. I found no pleasure in things I did. The world became very bitter for me. But I knew that. You watched everything I did. I couldn't open up my heart to you. That's it. Okay. How many of you participated? Raise your hands if you participated. How many of you got two seconds into and said, nah, this is not going to happen? How many of you got about four seconds into and said, oh, forget it. I'll just pick one and do the best I can on this stupid test. How many of you picked the written one? And that's because we're lazy. <laughs> How many of you got about six seconds into it, you're focused on one of them now, but you thought to yourself, you know, whoever's reading the Audible, and I wish they would shut up, I'm trying to focus here. Now, you're laughing because it's true. Now, here's the test. The test is simple. Both poems were very brief. Every line in every poem is brief, and I want to test you this way. I don't want you to quote the, both poems. I don't even want you to quote all of one of them. Just the first line of each poem. Who can quote the first line of each poem? You know why no one has ever gotten it in the world? It's because you cannot receive two or more streams of data simultaneously. And this, the attempt to do that causes data to leave. You probably started off trying to read the one on the screen. And when you're doing that, your brain cannot receive anything from the audible one. So you switched. Now that you're switched on the audible one, your brain cannot receive anything from the other, and you became frustrated, and your brain did you a favor. It said, pick one, because that's what it wants to do. It's a sequential unitasking processor. And so you pick the one, and even though you're now paying attention the way the brain wants you to, you have a distraction going on in the background in the form of the audible one, and that annoyance is now taking big chunks of data. And that is what the digital world has done to us. I have never said we should throw technology away. My beef is we have implemented it without any prior study on how the brain works. And so data leaves. Am I making sense to you? And so when we come to God, we have this fragmented thinking as well. Let me show you how this works out in a practical way and how we miss out not only on each other's company and things that are important that should be transferred from family member to family member, but how we also miss out on God. My wife will sometimes roam around in auditoriums, whether it be an education conference, whether it be a church or a school, and she'll videotape people uh, doing digital activities while I'm speaking. This happens to be a church, and I had just been called to the podium, and already Beth is locked in on this guy. Very common. We see this all the time. I have photograph after photograph, video after video of something like this going on every time I speak. Now, halfway through the message, Beth has moved to another part of the auditorium. There's a whole row of them, an entire row of them. And now this went on from the beginning of church to the end of church. And so eventually they get happy about something here. I'm not as sure. Their little thumbs are just going crazy here. But they give each other the high five. This guy up here in the back is fully asleep. Now, here's the truth. You're having a conference with Josh McDowell and his son, Sean. Truth matters, and it does. It's the only thing that frees us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
Now, I'm charged with telling you the truth in love, and I do love you, and I care about you because God cares about you, and everything I've been talking about is reversible, but let me explain to you what's happening here. If I were to ask these guys, fellas, how did I preach today? You know what they would say? Dude, you were awesome because they're nice guys, and I would thank them, probably give them a hug. If I were to say to these guys, fellas, can you multitask? You know what they would say? Dude, that's what we do. Join the party, old man. If I were to say, guys, why did you bring your phones to church? You know what they might say? Hello, my Bible app is on it. We take notes. But if these were young men of integrity, you know what they should have said? Fellas, how did I preach today? This is what they should have said. Brad, the truth is, you are a boring speaker. So we video gamed the entire time. You know why they should have said that? Because that's what they did. They should have said, Brad, you're a nice guy, but the truth is, you don't meet our needs. Our teachers don't meet our needs. The pastor is boring. You're boring. And so we gamed. Much more u valuable use of our time. And you know why they should have said that? Because that's what they did. They should have said, you know, Brad, the truth is, we took no notes. We never once opened our Bible app, and we have no idea what you spoke on because, frankly, you're not stimulating to me. And I'm not. In fact, one went to sleep on me. Not offended at them. You know why? I have compassion. I have been where those young men have been. With a big desk like mine, that shouldn't surprise you. With a degree in computer science, I paid a lot of money to be a professional nerd and toast my brain. You see, I was asked <laughs> by some, the pastors in the back if I would uh, include a little bit of my testimony, and I'm happy to do that. I, I was at one point way overweight. Maybe you've met gamers that were way overweight when they used to be very athletic when they were in school. Well, whilst I was not a video gamer, I was sitting at that big desk of mine making television content for Christian TV and Christian radio shows, thinking that because I was making Christian content, my brain was immune. But there's this pesky little thing called the truth. The truth is the brain doesn't distinguish content. In other words, just because it's educational doesn't mean it's not addictive. It's just as addictive as anything else. The brain is not going, hmm, now let me see here. That's World of Warcraft. That's bad, so I'll get you addicted. That, that's mathematics. I'll give you a pass. The brain just doesn't do that. The brain just responds with dopaminergic reactions based on stimulation, regardless of what's on the screen. Am I making sense to you? So because I was making Christian content, I would sit there justifying staying up half the night Beth begging me to come to bed, getting angry at me, me getting angry at her because I'm serving God here. And then she would slam the door and go to bed. I'd ignore her, which is a terrible thing to, for a man to do to his wife, and stay up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning overeating, and eventually it all came crashing down. That part of my brain turned gray. I became anhedonic and I was forced to do a detox. I'm happy to tell you that I detoxed successfully and I'm healed now for the most part. <laughs> uh, occasionally I have issues, but pretty much okay. But what I did eventually, instead of Netflix binging, which I used to do, and YouTube binging, which I used to do, I decided I would listen to my doctor who had been on my case for a good while to clear up some pretty bad blood test results with a genetic component. I don't know if you have any frame of reference for pounds or kilograms, but I was 194 pounds, overweight, horrible health. So I traded in, not all the screen time, I kept the stuff that was productive and started trading in all that screen time for nutritional training. And then if any of you here are calisthenics athletes, I became one of those and slowly got into the progression, and now I do muscle-ups. And with that came a good doctor's report in July, all the blood work is normal. And all of that, <laughs> look, thank you. 
I hope next year you can still applaud for me because it's a challenge to keep it this way. <laughs> but I'm trying. But do you understand I've traded in the negative side, not all of my technology, for that. But the thing that I really want you to take away from the video that I just showed you from those three guys who are in the church that I'm not mad at, and your children who are in the bedroom with the door shut, and you don't really know what they're doing, but you don't think they would do anything bad, you need to understand something. The children under our care are not being mentored and discipled by us any longer. Even though they're in our youth groups, even though they are in our Christian churches and in our Christian schools, the truth is the children under our care are no longer being discipled by us. They are being transformed by the culture through their devices. And I just showed you a microcosm of what I'm talking about. Pastor Peter asked me at lunch the other day, he said, how many of our young people are addicted to pornography? And I didn't want to answer him because the answer seems so extreme. I said, do you really want an, an, an answer to that? And he goes, yes. I said, 100%. And he said, well, Josh and Sean McDowell said the same thing to me. I just completed a research study in December. The, the results were just completed, but we did a research study at the University of South Africa back in December, and we were doing focus groups, and we, discussed, we were studying a number of things, but one of the things that came out of the study in the focus groups between the ages of 17 and 24, 99, about 99.5 percent of them were all in Christian churches, all but one participant in, of the four focus groups. All of them went to church but one. All of them, 100% male and female, were addicted to porn. And the thing that shocked us was it had become normalized to them. I've been interviewed on iTunes' number one podcast for men, and the presenter, the host, asked me, what scares you about pornography? And the first thing out of my mouth was, it will soon be normalized, and people won't want to hear a message on it ever again because we've gotten past that, and we're seeing it. Video gaming. Video gaming is huge. It's causing problems in places that may surprise you. The Entertainment Software Association, which is the organization that keeps track of numbers, they represent the video game industry, they keep track of these statistics, including this one. Uh, statistics about video gaming, including this one. The average age of a video gamer. Now, when I ask this in smaller crowds where we can take a show of hands and that sort of thing, it usually goes like this, 8, 14, 11, 10. But in fact, the real number is 35. And Beth and I are seeing this change marriages, ruin some of them. Uh, we were walking through a mall in Pretoria, South Africa, and I walked up to the Nintendo store because they were releasing a new game, and I want you to see the employee who was playing a game. He has hair on his face. This is not a child. And so I walked up to the Mario Brothers, made them think I was interested in them. I was not. I was interested in the guys behind them. Look at their ages. And they're having a party. They're all celebrating the release of the new game. This guy's having a beer to celebrate, and this is the average age. Now, I did find one kid staring out the window as if to say to me, please rescue me from these old hairy men in my store. And in places that you might not expect, even in Africa, eSports, playing video games professionally, 24-7 dedicated satellite network, eSports TV Africa. But look at the age of the hosts. I want to show you something else. On the left side, you'll see a rubber ducky. You'll see Marvel, Captain America Shield, Batman, Star Wars. They live in their own reality. When they create their own truth, a whole study has been done called postmodernism. First generation raised completely in a digital world. Their brains are wired radically different than their grandparents. And if I may say something spiritually to the 30 something year old gamers, especially if you have children and you're married. I have a word from God for you, and I'm being sincere. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I love you enough to confront you with this 
because God has better plans for you. In fact, the plans that He has for you are not to harm you, but they're to prosper you and to give you hope in the future. And if you have children, your full-time job is to provide for your family and to raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, not spend four and a half hours a day playing video games and sometimes longer on the weekends. It's time to be a man, a real man. This hasn't gone unnoticed in the secular world. Philadelphia Magazine, far from being a Christian resource, has this article, The Sorry Lives and Confusing Times of Today's Young Men. They don't have jobs. They're dropping out of college. They play video games all day and watch porn all night. Why won't guys grow up? There is a direct correlation between video gaming and pornography, statistically. Very close. The women are irate. The women are talking about men, young men, the men they like to date and marry, and here's what they're saying. All they want is sex. They don't care about relationships. They're so lazy. All they do is play video games. They aren't men. They're boys. I'm not mad at anyone. God has brought me here to confront this issue and not condemn you because all of this is reversible, and He loves you, and so do I. We need a paradigm shift in the church from the culture influencing us to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father influencing us. And as Christians, our mind and our focus and our attention should not be on anything other than Jesus Christ all the time, to tell you the truth, because we're commanded to pray without ceasing. Some of you who are a little bit older, do do you know who C.S. Lewis is? How about A.W. Tozer? My pastor, when I was very young in the ministry, was discipling me, and he gave me this little thin book called The Knowledge of the Holy. And I remember looking at him and said, thank you, pastor. I'll have this back to you tomorrow. And he went, (laughs) no, you won't. So I remember being in my room at university. When I was in university, I I remember I would go in there to have my devotion time, and I'd open the book. And I was reading about the attributes of God, the omnipotence of God, and and, and the omnipresence of God, and just the way Tozer is a great teacher. And, and, and the verses and the Scripture and his teaching was just jumping off the page. And I remember finding myself reading over and over again just short passages, and I found myself just caught up in the, the sweet, still presence of God saying, Oh, Jesus, I bless your name. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I, oh, this is so good. Thank you, Jesus, for being so real to me. And I remember I'd look at my watch and I'd say, God, I... I have to go to class, but I I don't want to leave this moment. Thank you for being so real to me. Now, can anyone in here relate to anything I just said? Do you remember those times of intimacy with God? We have two generations now who, for the most part, have absolutely no concept of what I just described to you. Nothing. They're too hyper-stimulated, and I'm not mad at anyone. My heart goes out to them. And so what do we do about all of this? Well, the first thing I want to do is talk to you about the porn addiction because that is the, by far, the number one problem that we have in the church and in the culture. The stats of porn addiction within the church and without are the same. I have a whole series on this on DVD. We're working on getting it into the Philippines. But remember this? Outside of a direct brain injury, that's the worst one of all. The word porneo, which is the Greek word from which we get our modern English word, pornography and pornographic, actually appear in the New Testament 25 times. And it's most often translated into the English as fornication or fornications or sexual immorality, which is plural because it encompasses all sexual deviancy from heterosexual sex to homosexual sex to bestiality and on and on, the worst thing you can think of in porn, porneia covers it. And the fornication part, which is just a small one of the definitions, it's certainly a valid definition of porneia, is sexual intercourse between two people who are not married. It is a sin. It's also translated whoredom, which is lewdness, unlawful intercourse with the other sex and worshiping of idols or idolatry and all healing begins with the fear of the Lord. Here's one of the 25 places that it appears, the words of our Lord. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, 
fornications, which is plural because it, porneia is, means all sexual deviancy. The NIV renders it sexual immorality. And here's the fear of the Lord. These are the words of our Master, our Savior, our Lord to those who are struggling with porn. And, and in my past, men, I'm not innocent. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. But if it'll help you, God many years ago saw fit when I repented, confessed it to God and to some other men, made myself accountable. God saw fit to forgive me, wash me in His precious blood, and He let me continue moving forward to, to what you see now standing in front of a lot of people, and He'll do the very same thing for you. These are the words of our Lord. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, just looking, and that's what porn is, it's looking lustfully, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And the Lord went on to say this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It begins with the fear of the Lord. And then confession. If we confess our sins, we get our forgiveness from God and from Jesus. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then we must have accountability. And home group, cell group is the best way to get this, to be transparent with a small group of people. That's what I did. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, not that God would judge you, but what, that He would do what? Heal you. Bring the color back in your brain. Get the wall down. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I love this quote from William Struthers. Confession is difficult for many men because it is an admission of failure. This is at odds with their understanding of their masculinity and Pride, the Scripture says, goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I felt the pride and do every time before I tell people, in my past I have guilt. But I, over time it's gotten easier to tell you this because God has forgiven me and He keeps allowing me to move forward. And again, that's what He wants to do for you. So swallow the pride, confess your sin to Him, make it right with other people, confess it to other people, then get them to pray for you, get into a home group, and let God put you on a path of moving forward and turning this world upside down for His glory. That's what He wants to do for the porn addicted, the video game addicted, the social media addicted, anyone. So let me give you just a quick list in closing to get the color back in your brain and get the wall down. The first thing is get all the technology out of everybody's bedrooms. And this is going to sound weird. Go to sleep. Teenagers are averaging four to six hours of sleep a night when they need nine and a quarter. Because creativity has been crushed in many people because of being introduced to technology too soon, I often get a question when they read this, well, if I do that, if I get the technology out of my bedroom, how am I going to wake up? And because of that question, I've had to add this to the presentation. It's true. There's mine. I strongly suggest that you stop being connected 24-7. Turn off all push notifications. Now, I didn't say not to respond to people, but just turn off all push notifications. The cortisol levels will drop in you, and you'll live in a state of peace. Now, I've got a neuroscience research project that I've set up at UNISA, University of South Africa, in early 2019 to study this at, at length. But I can tell you the preliminary results. Turn the push notifications off, and you will live at a state of peace throughout the day. If you have crossed over into digital addiction, this must be an option for you. And I hear laughter every time, but listen to me carefully. There are 400 digital detox rehabilitation centers in South Korea, the most wired nation on earth, and they're detoxing children as young as three. You know the first thing they do when they admit these guys and children into the detox center? They take their phones and their gadgets away because you cannot continue using the drug and get over the drug addiction. Now, I didn't say you shouldn't be able to get in touch with people, but a simple phone call will do and will not hurt your brain. 
I've never seen a positive brain scan from a video gamer. If I were you, I would stop video gaming altogether and swap them out for board and card games, 100%, full stop. People say, well, that's extreme, but I'll tell you what extreme is. Extreme is taking heroin and cocaine. That's what's extreme. Now, for goodness sakes, if you do decide to repent over this one and get rid of video games, don't sell your video games, otherwise you're a drug pusher. <laughs> Replace all electronic babysitters with humans right away. Never ever use another gadget to babysit ever again, including television. No music when studying or sleeping. Now, music is very healing, but it's very bad for you when you're studying. People say, what about classical music? And I'll go, you don't listen to classical music, you're just trying to get around it. I don't know if too many people listen to classical music, but there have been studies to debunk even that. And lastly, the number one problem that we have, the majority of parents believe their child is the exception to everything I've been covering with you. That's the number one problem that we have. So I want to finish this way. This, my family, is why I do what I do. Now we see this everywhere. It's ubiquitous, part of culture. We don't really even see it. It's there, but kind of ignore it now. You'll, know it, you'll see it again after today, I promise you. It'll drive you crazy. But this, my brothers and sisters, is a picture of deep, deep abiding intimacy. Their hearts have been fully given their emotions are fully yielded. And there's not a moment that goes by 24-7 that they're not available. And this is what I'm hearing Jesus say to the church all over the world as I stand in front of crowds after crowd after crowd. Jesus is simply saying to his church, I wish my people felt that way about me. I wish they would give their heart to me like that. I wish my people would love me like that. I wish my people were emotionally attached to me like that. Because the plans that I have for them are not to harm them, but to prosper them and to give them hope and to give them a future. May I pray with you? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to touch my family here today and maybe some who need to become part of the family of God. I pray that no one would be condemned, but remind my family here today that you brought them here to get the color back in their brains and to get the wall down, to restore relationships between each other and most importantly between you, and that you're a God who heals when we cooperate with you. So don't let anyone leave here with condemnation or a spirit of fear, but let them know they're loved. If you're here today and you're struggling with digital addiction in any form that I've been talking about, I want you to stand and let me pray a closing prayer over you of healing and deliverance. Would you just stand real quick, please? If you're struggling with this in any form, just stand up. God bless you. Just stand up. Humble yourself. Swallow that pride. Don't be destroyed by it. And just stand up and let me pray for you. God bless you. That's right. Some of you are surrendering by lifting your hands. You can do that too if you choose to. God bless you. God is not angry at you. He loves you. That's why he brought me here. He loves you deeply. So if you're struggling on any level with these addictions, stand to your feet and let me pray with you. If you feel in that tug in your heart... The other thing I would say if you're here today and you've never invited the healer whose name is Jesus to come into your heart for the very first time and you're saying, you know what? I need to get things right with God and then I'll deal with this. I want you to stand to your feet too. Let me pray with you. Anybody, you need Jesus for the first time. God bless you, sir. Stand up. Just stand up and say, yep, I need Jesus. God bless you. I need to get saved. I got to start at the starting point. God bless you. People are standing. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation and rededication. I would like for all of us to pray it out loud in support of those who are standing for salvation. And then I'll close 
with a prayer, a final prayer of deliverance. So can we pray this in support of those who are standing for salvation? And those of you who are standing for salvation, you be sure to say this to Jesus out loud. You ready, congregation? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I have sinned. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Change my life. I believe that you died on a cross and you rose again for me. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead my footsteps. And I confess that Jesus is Lord. Now let me pray a closing prayer over those of you who are standing for digital addiction. Father, honor the humility of my family here today. The Lord just prompted me, some of you need to stand. Stand now. I'm not even looking. Just stand up and get in on this, please. Humble yourself. Father, in the name of Jesus, honor those who have swallowed their pride. Break that addiction, for it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. Restore relationships in the home. Give parents wisdom in making the changes that we talked about today. And then honor them with a massive, massive dose of intimacy with God where you are more appealing than anything this culture could ever hope to offer. And then help us after we detox to come back to technology and find out where it actually fits and where it's healthy and not addictive. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray these blessings over my family. Amen. God bless you, family. Love you.